just doing a circle knife made out of surgical steel, which is a wondrous metal, and it's a naturally antibiotic, um, and a laser, an arc sodium laser, very, very small. All right, you're on. So I'm on. Okay. Ready. So we begin with the metallurgy. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am Carl the Drum Guy, and I'm going to give you a very beginning understanding of metallurgy and how it pertains to spell work, or how it corresponds. Um, I'll read from my notes now. <laughs> I tend to ramble, sorry. Uh, study paganism and magic long enough, and you will eventually find correspondences from correspondences for everything. Now, metals have been with humanity for many centuries, from the making of tools, of increasing the strength, all the way uh, from from personal items that give personal protection and strength of crops, all the way up to these glorious ceremonial items that you'll find in most, for lack of a better word, modern churches nowadays. But in the uh, pagan cultures, a lot of these items were things made out of gold, silver, the precious metals were generally used as um, glorifications, as burial masks or small deities on altars because the metals were too soft. They didn't understand about alloying, adding things to them to make them stronger. So the metallurgy walked hand in hand with us, uh, much like I said in my beginning little blurb about this, um, ever since the first proto-human picked up a piece of lightning forged steel on the ground and decided, hey, I can do something with this, and made a tool out of it, or however, you know, I wasn't there 40,000 years ago, I would elect it, and, but uh, let's see. And what we'll focus on tonight is the magical and ceremonial correspondences of these different metals. Um, one of my favorite connections of metal is how one can make a tangible association of a connection to a god or, or your regular people or everyday life as far as farming or how to connect to things. You make a tangible item that connects to non-tangible things, such as um, faith and how things grow and, and how to make offerings that will bring about positive in outcomes. Um, it's hardly a new concept. <laughs> you know, that's been around for decades, not decades, centuries. Okay, now, in my studies, I, I figured out um, that there were seven, which is a very important number to remember, it will, that will come up again in a little bit, um, seven noble metals of antiquity. Um, what's fascinating about these metals is a lot of them have correspondences that go along with a god or one of the planets in our solar system. The seven visible planets to ancient life, to the ancient peoples, up until Galileo with his wonderful invention of the uh, brass and glass, magnifying glass. Now, we only had the seven planets they could see, and these all, all these seven metals I'm going to talk about will have a corresponding planet and god that they actually um, are used to work with. Now, number one, the one that everybody could probably guess is right at the top of the list, gold. Um, it is the metal most associated with the sun. Uh, it's used potentially for everything from personal growth and gain to financial success and power. And once again, is one of the few metals that from antiquity has lasted all the way through till now. And all seven of these metals have such a connection and vitality to human life that they have followed us into the present from as far back as 40,000 years ago. So, um, the ancient Egyptians used gold uh, for sun power and was given to the pharaohs who were seen as descendants of the gods and were thus were, they were buried with these huge caches of gold and <laughs> just the wonderment of avarice. Um, it was to ensure a comfortable afterlife. The 
the particular culture of the Egyptians with the pharaohs and everything, they were buying their way in, as it were. Now that was eventually um, pushed away to where your your soul weighed as much as a feather, and then that would open the gates to the positive side of the afterlife. But before that, they used to actually buy their way in. So they'd have big gold bricks and gold-plated chariots and <laughs> horses buried with them, and everything was gold everywhere. Indulgences. Yes, but they were also extremely generous with their gold in that time because they would actually hand it out um, in and it made its way into large parts of Europe as um, amulets to ward off evil and predominantly to protect children and homesteads. Um, the gold was used mostly for small children and for the home because what's more precious than your future? As a grown adult, you've made it. You're, you're the one who's providing the food and everything. You want to protect the next generation, so that's what a lot of the gold ornamentation was used for for the children. Uh, In Norse culture, it was seen as a tool for conducting trade, as well as tribute to the gods for times of great bounty. It's one of the wonderful things about gold in 24 karat form, in its purest form. <clears throat> if you put it in a roaring bonfire to send it on to the gods, it will actually gasify it will burn down to where it turns into a gas and go up with the smoke and be gone it actually makes its way to the gods that way it's the only the only other metal that will do that is mercury and we'll get to that in a while but gold i thought was fascinating you could just throw it into a 1200 degree bonfire and it goes directly to whatever your chosen deities are uh, i wouldn't suggest that now <laughs> <laughs> oh, way to give me ideas, Carl. <laughs> well, there's there's a lot of anagrams for gold. Um, things that are yellow, stuff that is handmade and truly puts your heart into it if you make it out of a gold substance. It doesn't actually have to be gold itself. The intent to the gods will be there, and that's really what you're looking for now. Uh, let's see. And that's that's it for gold. Let's see. And then number two, right behind it, is silver. And this one, it's used by just about every culture that follows a magical bent of some of some sort. Silver is ubiquitous in that it's in just about every ceremony from every culture and walk of life. Um, may I, can yes. I interject a little bit? Absolutely. Go back to gold. Yes. Have you? heard of how the Mayan culture used gold with the coca plant? No, I have not. So, okay. I'll have to research that though. Mm -hmm. That was, yeah. yes. No, I, I, I could imagine that it was used to um, open the mind and go on spirit journeys and really take you to a <laughs> yes. whole other plane. They, yeah. I know I know. in the Mayan culture they use it a lot as ornamentation. Their priests wear the big beautiful headdresses because it, personally, in functionality, it's a useless metal. You can't make weapons, you can't make tools. It's all ceremonial because it was all 24 karat. But the thing with the, I'll it have to research to about the coca. It for space travel too. Yep, that, yep. You couldn't have, you couldn't have one of these without gold. No. There's a lot in there that's gold and copper. Yeah. So metal follows us even now. <laughs> no matter what you do, you're going to find metal somewhere. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I will research that. Okay. Any other questions about gold? No? Okay. Moving forward. I find so. <laughs> All right. Silver. Once again, it used, used in a bunch of uh, different magical traditions from all over the world. It's a true neutral metal in that it's, it's considered to be in the same family with the noble gases. It won't react to things. Um, it doesn't give up a molecule. It won't pull a molecule away from anything. You can add it to stuff, and silver just does what silver does. It's like, yep, I'm silver. Here I am. Praise me. <laughs> that's that's what it does. Um, it's uh, generally associated with the moon because you know the reflected silver light of the moon, and, and everybody here is familiar with that. Um, it also um, is purported to. It's magical. 
connections are um, intuition, psychic sensitivity, and it can. It's also very powerful to use it in um, defensive magics due to its reflective properties and its purity of voice. It, it's you know pure silver can damp down a lot of negativity and it can reflect that back to whatever sent it to you. So good, like having a mirror facing a doorway into your house when people enter, it ought to, it pushes out like if you, that's one of the modalities. It will push out whatever negativity is trying to come in with them. And so having a mirror facing a door is a good thing. So I like that giant mirror in our front room. Even though we have a blanket over it, it's kind of wipes out anything anybody tries to walk in the house with. It's a big six by eight mirror. <laughs> But would that be any white metal, or it has to be silver? Uh, in our in our modern times, silverback mirrors are not something you're going to find a lot. They use the yeah. whatever the shiny stuff is they put on mirrors now. Yeah. They don't make them out of um, in the antiquity that I'm talking about. They would have just been a big flat hammered out plate of, of silver, mm -hmm. and then shined as much as they polished it as much as they could. But um, but nowadays, you you can you can have uh, stand-ins for that kind of thing. A modern mirror will reflect anything that's reflective. Um, once again, it depends on intent. You can charge a mirror and use it for that purpose. But having any kind of silver attached to the mirror, you could have a simple amulet and hang it from a corner. It will impart its magical powers into that mirror and magnify it. You could have a piece of silver like a teapot sitting on a on a table mm -hmm. in your in front of your door yep. you know something yep. like that anything like so that would it would yep. it, there'd be a little reflection you kept it polished real you, good you have to charge it i mean it's it's a uh, charging it, it's a self-charging metal it's it it holds its own power okay. if you really wanted to charge it with an extra like deification kind of power um moon magic is good put it out during the full moon and let that charge it up i understand what you I mean about charging okay. yeah. yeah all right it's uh, also very representative of uh, truth and trust. Um, gifts of silver carry this aspect. So making a gift of, of uh, silver to someone has a much higher um, value far beyond what you paid for the silver. You know, it's, I'm, I'm giving it to you as a sign of my trust to you. That's why a lot of the Norse armbands and a lot of, you know, rings are made out of silver. It's a, a circle of trust. The gold, gold with the wedding rings is also a part of that. It's the purity. Mm -hmm. right. But I, I just, I think it's fascinating that it, a lot of times those gifts of silver carry such a higher onus than just the money. You know, you, you want a person to trust and believe in you. Okay. And that's, this is silver here. In case anybody's unfamiliar with what silver looks like, <laughs> pass that around. Uh, that one needs to be polished a little bit, but that's raw silver. So is that, that one even, yellow? It's, it's got uh, the X's have a little bit of yellow gold coating on them. Okay. So I think it just needs to be polished really good. It needs to be cleaned. Okay. And number three, my personal favorite because I am studying this, um, is copper. Um, probably from the dawn of man till now and continuing on for many thousands of generations this little chunk of metal right here is probably going to follow us forever it will never be without copper uh, it's the basis for the majority of electrical work um, it charges just about anything you put with it uh, it's just, it was first discovered about 10,000 years ago um, it was a total fluke that it was found. Um, the people that first discovered copper were Roman explorers that had moved east. And, uh, pass that around too. and the wonderful thing about that is um, 10,000 years ago, the ancient civilizations that were around the Mediterranean, they had learned to actually smelt and, and uh, saltwater temper the copper and then adding either tin or zinc to it, you get bronze or brass. Yeah. Good night. Now you good add, night, good, good night. night. Now if you add, if you add, 
get a little example of the differences between the two. So this little seal is a cast, this is a cast bronze. Okay, and it'll, it'll have a little different, you'll hear the difference between tin and zinc. This is copper with tin added. See, it just kind of doink, doesn't really resonate. And it's, you can hear the tinniness of it, it's higher. Mm -hmm. Now, you take copper and you add zinc to it, and it's, you get brass. <laughs> so it's a drastically different sound between the two metals, that eat, and that's alloy. Um, but, like with copper, is there like a version of it that it's not the wires? Is it, like, what does it look like if it's, I guess it's stone form? Oh, it comes out of the ground. Like this wow. this has been melted and turned into wire. Okay. When it comes out of the ground, it comes out in either a granulated powder form, which has to go through a refinery, or you can actually find places um, out in Arizona and Nevada and the Badlands area. They're huge since since closed copper mines because it destroyed the land. They used oh. a lot of acid to burn the copper out of the metal, out of the out of the stone. But it comes out of the ground just like that. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. It's not an alloy. Yeah, it's a pure it's a pure metal. This is pure copper. That's why I brought it in. It's there's nothing added to this. It just forms like that. It stays soft. But what's weird about this stuff is if you get this, you don't even have to get it hot. If you held this over that candle flame for about two minutes, it would actually decrease the the um, cohesion in there and make it even softer. Wow. Yeah. So it's a fascinating metal. Here's another thing that's fascinating about it. One, it's probably the most conductive material. It is used everywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's cheaper. Gold and silver is electric propensity is 12 and 87 times higher. But, yeah. But you're not going to put gold, <laughs> gold <wire>. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. This is way but, cheaper. That's why we use it so much. But it's funny. There was some, I think there was one culture that actually used copper as the backing of its money. Yeah, there were quite a few. The Greeks did that. Um, the Greeks, let's see, they learned to smelt it and shape it and then later into all manner of things were possible. Um, they made almost, they made tremendous amounts of things out of copper. They made their armors, um, edifices for their spiritual buildings, um, tools to work with, with all this. and. Uh, and one of their greatest uh, deposits of it, they called it copper, copper as. Okay. Um, or, yeah, and Lorraine has a question. Yes. Okay. Lorraine, go ahead and unmute, and you can ask your question. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I I was trying to, um, you were, uh, you kind of, I don't know if it was just my headphones. Um, I thought it was interesting. Did you say copper plus zinc is what makes brass? Yeah. Okay, and there was another, what was the one you said before, copper and, was it tin? Yeah, that makes bronze. And that makes, oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, the tin, the tin strengthens the copper to the point where it becomes bronze. And that's the beginning of the Bronze Age. That's why the Greeks 10,000 years ago, um, all of a sudden became this world power oh, wow. because now they had uh, metal and tools and, and trade goods that were made out of this metal that didn't just wear out, didn't bend, it didn't warp. Um, the Hittites as well. Yeah. That was well, the, the backbone of the Hittites. Iron. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, 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 the Hittites. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to that. We'll get there. <laughs> okay, we'll get to my favorite splitter. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but to Thank clarify, you. brass, brass is copper and zinc, bronze is copper and tin. And it just depends on the ratios, the quality of, of those two metals. Uh, let's see. The Greeks called copper Aeus Cyprium uh, because their biggest mine was on the island of Cyprus or Kupros in their language, hence copper. Um, since this island was the birthplace of Venus, uh, copper is often associated with her and the planet Venus. Remember that I was saying there would be planetary 
uh, oh. correspondences. Yeah, it's Venus and the goddess what? Venus. What's the bet that Mercury is going to be associated with Mercury? Mercury. <laughs> 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 Something tells me. That's a good idea. A feeling. Spoiler alert. Right. She figured it out. Bet? <laughs> Take a yeah. bet here. I'm the treasurer. <laughs> That's a good point. We will get to that. Um, copper is often associated with her and the planet Venus as well. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of copper is how it conducts and directs electricity. Um, the electricity is, it loves the copper so much that it will not penetrate it to use it. It flows on the surface. It doesn't come through the center. The ions uh, in it line up so that the, the electrical impulses can jump across. That's why it's a good thing for conducting positive energy into yourself. Um, using a, a wire like this, say so you feel like you came away from something that left you with a lot of negative energy, you could take a piece of wire and wrap it around your finger like that, stick it in the ground, and instantly ground yourself. Really? Yeah, copper is a very powerful so you grounding keep tool. It attached to you. Yeah, just like that. And you can the put ground. it in the ground, and it'll draw all that negativity and right out. And... That's cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just don't do it in a lighting storm. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> that hurt. Yeah. No, I but do. But no, it, it really so, does. So sometimes attachments occur. Mm -hmm. And that's a very quick way of just getting rid of the Absolutely. attachments. Yeah. yeah. And you can you can really do that with just about all of these metals, but copper is the most powerful for grounding magic. It will draw out, it'll actually draw everything into it, pull it right into the ground out again. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thanks for that. Yeah. It was worth my time. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, an example of this is I have a wand. Um, with copper round, wrapped around it, and it, it works as a boost as well. It, you know, I put my thumb, I, I forgot to bring it with me, but it's much like much like this, but imagine a big piece of wood through the middle. So you can actually put your fingers on the copper and charge whatever you're doing with your own energy through the copper into the spell. Nice. Yeah, like Wait, I said, like copper's a repeat. Huh? Wrap your wand. If you have a if you have a wooden wand that and a lot of us witchy okay. poos do this, um, we have wands or staffs. Um, you can put wrap copper around any of your um, spiritual or magical tools, uh -huh. and it will boost the uh, energy that's putting in being put into it. It acts kind of like an and it can it'll it'll absorb the the positive as well as the negative. So you can take the negative and ground it out of you, or you can put it on a wand that's going to be used for nothing but positivity and use that to cast your magic. Okay. Or you can, I've seen people actually have, as a wand, just a piece of twisted copper. And it it's, works. yeah, and it works. So, yeah, very, very magical stuff. Um, let's see. Also used in financial and healing magics, like those bracelets that people wear for the arthritis, you know, you have a copper one on each wrist and it, it, it uh, regulates the flow of energy through your body and a lot of times, you know, people that have said that copper actually stops the arthritis in their hands. So it's, a, it's a very positive metal to have. And also too, it is said that if it gets, if it changes color, if it gets yeah. dark, it means that you should probably go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. I've seen this. Moving on. All right, the other little metal that I talked about, tin. Now, tin. And you say these were formerly noble metal. Yes, because a lot of them don't, they don't interact, uh, they don't change their structure. They absorb an alloy with other structures and make them stronger. So they don't, they don't, like copper becoming bronze, it's because you added either tin or zinc to it. It's an amalgam. It makes both of the metals within that amalgam much stronger than they would be alone. Same it does for gold and silver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you add something to it. You add nickel to gold and you wind up with, it, it becomes, you can take it down to six carat and wind up being as strong as steel. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you, you, you're a jeweler, you, you know that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, like the copper, like this wire, I can bend it right now with my finger, but no problem. Same thing with this tin and, foil. And also, the, the adding copper to silver makes it stronger, harder. Mm -hmm. And 
adding silver to copper does the inverse, the opposite. So it makes the copper it's more malleable. More malleable and easier to melt. Nice. So if you want your copper melt fast, just drop a little bit of silver in it and it goes boom. Mm. Yeah. And melts. Well, is it, they're noble metals. They like to play with each other. <laughs> but that's that's interesting. It, one way silver and copper one way becomes stronger, mm -hmm. but the other way, if you do the ratios, the, the, the it makes it softer. softer. Oh. I mean, softer in the that. sense that because copper is already soft, mm -hmm. softer in the sense that it makes it easier to melt because copper is really strong. Is very strong. Oh yeah, it takes 1950 degrees to get it liquid. Yeah, because that, if you <laughs> consider that the copper is pure. But you can't do the same with silver. If you were to wear like 999, and that, that's as far as it goes, silver, after years, it would rub off on your skin and become thinner and thinner, mm -hmm. but not so for copper. Oh. Yeah, okay. copper strong stuff. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Um, now we have tin. Everybody pretty familiar with aluminum foil? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, brought, I brought that in because tin, true tin foil, is um, toxic to the touch. That's why we don't have tin cans anymore. Oh, yeah. uh, it, it's ah, skin yeah. permeable. It means if you hold a piece of tin, um, the toxic parts of the metal will go through your skin and into your bloodstream. That's why people drank, yeah, tin is... That, yeah. That's what happened that's to the Arctic we, explorers. Exactly, and that's why we moved away from tin cans for beer and and, um, quote, and food and such. What are we using now? Aluminum. Oh. It's almost the same. The, the main difference between the two is aluminum is shiny silver like this. Foil. Yeah, we still say tin foil. <laughs> and tin cans. Yep. Tin aluminum can. Can. Because I thought all those cans are still tin. Yep. <laughs> well, we still call them tin, so it's easy. Well, aluminum, <laughs> aluminum, is, aluminum is right up there with being toxic, but you, I'd have to like eat a piece like this every day for 20 years <laughs> to, to be <laughs> to have a salt. <laughs> Not recommended. No, but, yeah, everybody's like I said, everyone's familiar with tinfoil. Uh, tin, straight out of the ground, it looks like a basic white powder. It doesn't come out in chunks like uh, raw aluminum powder. Uh, it actually is just a dust. They have to refine it and melt it to turn it into sheets to use as tin. Yeah, it's neat stuff. Let's see, it's associated with Jupiter, which is, <laughs> that sounds funny because it, it is one of the, on its own, weakest metals but it's associated with the strongest god that there is. Because Jupiter. that's how they got bronze. Yeah, that's because you add it to something else. Because you add you add the power of tin to any other metal and it does something on the Rockford scale to increase like 30, 30 times stronger than it would normally be by itself. Most of these noble metals will do that. Let's yeah, see. so they added also to silver these days to create, um, I forgot the name, and the silver then doesn't tarnish. I can, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, because alum, uh, aluminum and the tin is, uh, they found things in ancient Roman burials, going back even before the Roman Empire was established, um, of uh, farmers and, and such being buried with small tin representations of their goats, animals, that, you know, to go with them in the afterlife. And they're still, they look, they're a little white because they've oxidized from being in the earth for so long, but it's still a solid little animal figurine. It didn't break down. So in our coins, what would you say would be the percentage wise of actual, like a penny, for example, how much copper would actually be in a penny? About 15% now. Yeah. yeah, it's about, it's roughly 15%. None. No, they didn't, they, they switched over total alloy now? I think, yeah, I, in, in the past it was, Oh, yeah, I've got ones from the, the 40s that are solid copper. I don't remember oh. when it changed, but yeah. you know, it's it's just plated. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the new about yeah, solid you scrape copper them. pennies, they're worth more than one penny. Yeah, because <laughs> they're worth the copper. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a fa fascinating stuff. Let's see. Associated with Jupiter, both the planet and the god. And this is tin. Romans called it plumblum album, which means white lead. Hmm. Hence, oh. and they they kind of knew it was a little toxic even back then. It's um, often blended to add strength and potency to other metals. 
a lot of times, like I said, is weak on its own, but if you add it to other stuff, it can just spike the strength of other things and drive the, the magical propensities for them way up. It doesn't oxidize or break down from weathering. So you could literally take a filigree little tin thing and put it on the roof here to build and come back in 10,000 years, it'll still be there. Nice. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. doesn't get hurt by being out at all. Um, it's prim primarily used, and I hope I don't lose anybody here, primarily used with sexuality and the sacral chakra. Nice. Um, <laughs> in this, it's, it's used to be used to draw that which you most desire to you. And that's the raw. Also, very Ju Jupiter like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, this is yeah. connections with Jupiter. It's, it's the strength and power of passion that, that you want to draw to you. Um, particularly rejuvenation and regeneration on a physical level. Uh, it works. It, it, this is the weird thing about it and why a lot of canning companies in the 1850s to about 1920 used it as canning. It's a natural antibactericide. It naturally kills off any bacteria that gets on it. That can be why it's bad for humans. Because if you get it in you... Like silver. Yep, exactly. Uh, let's see, where's that? It's a powerful musical metal when used to make bells. Um, yeah, that's... Hence, that's why this the brass thing. You add it to the copper, and you get brass and wonderful bells that way. Do you um, have any? Sorry, do you have any information on tin that say whether the utilitarian um, um, tin is an alloy of something? No, it's not. It's tin is straight by itself. It comes out of the ground as a white powder. Goes through the smelting process. Gets flattened out into plates, and then would get stamped into cans or whatever shape. Um, container they needed it to be really? yeah it's a it's a raw element tin comes out of the ground just just I thought it was strange too I also thought that tin was always a an alloy of some sort but nope it's a raw element comes right out of the ground like a white powder and it's complex to me because I use it and in um, Tula was experimenting with metallurgy and it burns off to a white powder mm -hmm. and if you remelt that alloy that you make of it a few times all the tin eventually burns off yes and but it's <laughs> it, that's so bizarre i know well when you when um one of the things i did discover is that when you add it to things um you have to add it 50 percent more than what you want the final product to be because right. it burns yes. off because it cooks off a lot of it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's see and uh jupiter's lightning bolts were the symbol typically used for tin in a lot of his um, temples in Rome and in Greece, you would find six foot tall tin lightning bolts right as he came in through the door. You guess who uh, stole that idea? <laughs> Winds up becoming Zeus's symbol later on. Yeah. Um, and then when fired with copper, you get bronze. So that's that's where bronze comes from. That's a wonder, like I said, they're, oh, these, these seven are all noble that by themselves, they're virtually indestructible, but you add them to other stuff and it just really drives it up. Now, another one of my personal favorites, and this one is everywhere. It's the first super hardenable metal that, that humankind found, iron. Yes. <laughs> it's in almost, it's in, it's in the simplest thing to the most complex machinery that we have. Everything's got some side of iron part. Um, it's associated with the earth itself. Um, it gets that connection because of the way it's mined and the fact that it's an incredibly strong metal even on its own. Um, it's connected with the sky and the universe. Um, as the first iron humanity used was meteorite iron. Before they knew to dig deep into the earth to get it, big meteorite would hit the ground and send little iron pieces everywhere. Yeah. So that was, you know, you just walk along, oh, I'll use that to make something. And now you have a new plow. <laughs> um, Another thing about meteoric iron actually was one of the weakest forms of iron. Yeah, that's why they added added a lot of stuff. I'm, we're, we're moving, yeah, <laughs> so moving forward, it's okay. Uh, it's heavily infu influenced by the as above, so below. Um, use, using iron in grounding rituals, 
and uh, astral travel. If you do a lot of third eye astral projection, um, if you keep a hunk of iron, raw iron in your hand, it acts as an anchor to this plane of existence. So you won't wind up traveling so far out that you run into something that decides it wants to keep you there. You've got that iron in your hand as an anchor point. And to turn so the iron grip. Exactly. So you'll always be able to pull yourself back with that iron. Um, yeah, it acts as a anchor in the physical world. A hematite is another form of magnetized iron. Um, that actually occurs within the Earth's mantle and then comes up as, as hematite. Uh, that's, that's, um, I didn't realize that was a metal. Yeah, hematite, it's a, it's a type of, uh, under certain pressure and certain water conditions, the iron will turn into hematite, becomes a stone, but it's still iron. If you, you can melt it and, and forge it just like iron. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Hematite in the form of magnetized iron creates a magical barrier. So if you want to keep the, once again, if you want to keep horrible things away from you, hematite being a reflective metal, mm -hmm. being that it's magnetic, um, it actually will change the course of negative energy and draw it down, down and away from you. Let's see. So if you don't have raw iron, could you use hematite the same way? Yes, you can. But be careful mm -hmm. because just as it can protect, it can also push away positive. Mm. That's the point I was waiting for you to reach. Everything mm -hmm. says get away negative. Everything's positive. No, this, the, you got to be careful. It can, it can shove away everything good that you're trying to do too. Much like the selenite or as you spoke of before with the smudging with certain types of sages, mm -hmm. it's, it's the atomic bomb of, of the spiritual world. You want everything gone out of your house? Just walk around with a big hunk of iron in your hand and you know, run it down the door frames, run it across the top of your windows. It grounds out and removes everything. Does Sa Paulo Santo, Santo Paulo, yeah, Paulo Santo does the same thing? Yes, that can, that it can also, it can push out the good and the, and the, and the positive. Because yeah. somebody recommended it and I use it and I know it is, a lot I do, of it's, a lot of it's, it's just, intent. You know, yeah. Everything good goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the root asphatida, aka devil's dung, when burnt, that does the same thing too. But yeah, he's talking mm -hmm. about the metal. So yeah. But if you then you then you're free to be able to put your positive back. So wow. that's the thing with the iron. You can actually repulse everything out of an area, and then in the same turn, turn the iron over, put it in your other hand, and bring it positive. Oh, and nice. you know. So it's all about intent. The back, the right brings it, well, brings it. your uh, yeah, your dominant hand mm -hmm. is what you would want to banish, and then your your other hand is what you would bring in with. Okay. So, yep. Okay, Lorraine has another question. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Lorraine. Sorry, um, I guess everybody else is talking. I don't want to interrupt. Sorry. Um, uh, go right ahead. So. And she said that, like, okay, for example, I know that when you burn a black candle, you're supposed to burn a white candle at the same time so that the, the good stays while the black candle acts like a, like a black hole and sucks all the negative. Yeah, that'll draw in all the, sucked up all Is the negative. Is there something similar to when you're using? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a balance. Is there, some, is there something similar like you were saying regarding uh, the hematite or using iron? The same with the selenite because I wasn't uh, aware of that. Yeah, well, the, with with those, with the iron, the selenite, or even with smudging, anytime you completely remove everything from an area, you create a void. Now, nature hates a mm -hmm. void. Okay, it will fill it with something, and it might not be something you asked for. So, the best way to do it is to have your positivity and everything set up already. So that as soon as you get done cleansing an area, you move straight into refilling it with the positive. And iron is really good for that. Um, I, yeah, okay. that's what I have. These are very old um, house nails, somewhere in the 1800s. I'm not exactly sure how old they are, but that's those are raw iron. And actually, they're not 100% raw iron. They have a little bit of... Um, what did, what did they put in them? 
carbon. They did something to add carbon to them, so they're a little bit carbon steel, so that I can't break them like this, they won't snap. But if I hit it with a hammer from the side, it breaks right off. But those, yeah, those is are... It, is that the same way that um, they say that having, like, a, a horseshoe is the luck? Yes, you, you leave it with the tines facing up above your front door, that way it catches all the luck. Yeah, that's it what out. I have. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yep, but that. if you ever wanted so to... it's better to keep it above the, the door? Yes, think? above the front door, but you want it facing upwards. And if you ever want to clear out your house yeah, and get no, rid of everything, have it everything, right. yep, you take, that, you take that horseshoe in your right hand, hold it so that it's facing downwards, and just walk around your house, and then walk right okay. out your back door, go around your house, come back through the front door, face it back upwards, and put it right back above your front door. That will eliminate um, that. Okay, I have a honeydew project tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> but that's that's a Thank very quick, that. easy way to, to to cleanse, remove, and recharge with iron. Is using a horseshoe that way. Oh, amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. Uh, and let's see, we talked about the void and how to refill it. Okay. Iron is associated with the planet Mars. Ah, oh, Mars. Hence the, the red rust planet because most of the soil there is um, iron, oxide. iron oxide. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, actually the lakes in Minnesota, they taste like rusted iron because of the iron, iron range. Iron oxide everywhere, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's associated with the planet and the god. Uh, being a war god, iron was the um, archetypical representation of the warrior. Um, swords, shields, armor, things of that nature. Uh, also brings up a lot of power and courage. Uh, much of humankind's conquest is rooted in our ability to manipulate iron. As you know, we build chariots and catapults and knives and arrowheads. And For more of that, <laughs> it becomes, <laughs> yeah, it, it, but you <laughs> also have um, iron kettles for cooking. Yeah. Um, iron tools for um, like scythes and, and reaping yeah. tools for bringing in the harvest. Wow, so cheers. iron isn't always about war. Iron has walked hand in hand with us it's for a, centuries. It's a battle used for tools. Yes. I mean, and some of those are tools of the war. Line, uh, plowshares to swords and then yep. swords to plowshares. Right back again, yep. Good. Because iron was so malleable and not set like it is now, steel can't really be done like that. You get a, yeah, you got to But iron it can't. It. Yep. You can turn an iron scythe into an iron blade if you need to go to war. And then once war is over, hey, back into guess what? Again. You can bring it. You can forge it right back into a scythe without losing too much of it. Mm -hmm. Well, the 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 Syrians were the first people to adapt iron after the Bronze Age collapse. Yes. And that's how they took over so much of the Near East for so long. Yeah. And also coincidentally how we got to keep the Epic of Gilgamesh. Well, it's kind of hard to stop the stop the enemy at the gates when their swords can cut through yours. <laughs> <laughs> but in, you know, in iron amulets, um, a lot of them have been found uh, in uh, many of the Norse. I know I, I hammer on a lot about Norse, but they were one of the few cultures that did use iron in a lot more forms than just weapons of war or plowshares. Um, they would make elm uh, amulets with the helm of awe, which is a blessing, asking a blessing of Odin, and or the hammer of Thor, and many of those have been found in a lot of the uh, Norse burials. Even in the Celtic burials, some Scottish burials in the Highlands, um, they will find these uh, remnants of the Norse occupation of the land. So, and it was all made out of iron. And it was designed, they were designed to instill a sense of um, happiness and peaceful moving on. And that was mainly for the people that are still alive bearing the person. So, now we come to lead. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't seem like it would be that big of a deal, but, oh, it's but, um, Early alchemists recognized lead as the heaviest of the base metals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a, yeah, it was associated with Saturn, the planet, and the god. Um, one of the wonderful things about lead is it blocks out all sound and light. So if you make a box of lead, you don't want any light to ever touch what's in it. 
just make a box out of lead, close it up. It's the molecular density of it is so much that nothing can get through. Superman can't even see it. Exactly. <laughs> well, that, yeah. 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 Um, stops. It stops energy as well. So if you if you have something that and, and I wouldn't recommend handling raw lead. Um, once again, it is skin permeable. It can actually get into you just by holding it. Um, I have good lead. It's also. Yeah, well, there's there's types of lead nowadays that are they're uh, alloys. They're mixed with other things to actually stabilize and keep the lead from coming out. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like this solder. There's that's probably got about 30% lead in it, but it's mixed with other metals that make it safe to handle. It bonds it. Yes, yeah, so I mean back in the day, the most common ingredient in most forms of makeup that people wore was lead, and there was like so many cases back in the day with yeah. lead poisoning. Just, but. I think we're going to get to that. Are you, yeah, are you, get about you bring up a good point, sir. Yeah. <laughs> good point. Okay. It's very toxic. can be absorbed through the skin as well as ingested. Um, anybody familiar with Caligula and Nero? Oh, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. They think, yes. uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff coming out now that they were, they were the most famous examples of lead-based insanity. Yeah. Um, it's because a lot of the water and a lot of the makeups and the powders they used were lead-based because it was, it was when mixed with certain minerals the lead would allow it to stick to the skin very very well and leave a sheen yeah because the oh. lead bonded to the skin and the other stuff bonded to the lead mm -hmm. so it made like a coating that, and and they didn't realize that that lead was being absorbed right into you yeah. <laughs> well that's also, why he made it for speedy the console also <laughs> lead yep. is uh lead in its base form is radioactive mm. a little bit yeah very, very little, but it is radioactive. Yeah. But that's that's one of the also the other reasons why, as he said, it blocks all energy. Mm -hmm. It is by far the best defense against radiation. Mm -hmm. With water being the second best, mind you, for one foot of lead, you need like three foot of water. And here's an example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving forward. Thank you, sir. See, lead is also the metal of transformation. And that's straight from the alchemists um, because they were always trying to turn lead into, into gold yeah. <laughs> because they are only two points away on, on the on the elemental table. Okay. Um, it's, oh, paint, Lynn the Happening wrote paint. Yeah, lead oh, paint. Lead paint. Yeah, yeah. Because it was, it, like I said, it makes things stick to other things very well. Yeah. It's <laughs> super toxic, but it's got, <laughs> it's got purposes. <laughs> um, it's a metal of transformation. It's excellent for stability and grounding during meditations. Once again, it does not have to be touching you. It just has to be in the room and your intent focused on it. It's just, okay. and it's a lot like iron in that extent that it acts as an anchor. It's a big, heavy weight that will bring you back to yourself so you didn't get lost out there in the void. How close is lead and pewter? Lead and pewter? Um, at one point they're interchangeable. I think pewter has, does pewter have tin added to it? Pewter has something added to it that yeah, makes it a little tin. stronger. So you yeah. can make vessels and stuff out of it. But I believe that's but what it is. I think it's also tin. toxic. Yeah, it's because yeah. of the lead. If you, yeah. Uh, I recall the Romans would write curses on lead strips, you know, thank yep. you, Claudius. And then they would find it in his in his uh, burial tomb yeah. because the stuff doesn't break down. <laughs> Let's see, for stability and grounding, um, it's an excellent conduit for speaking to the underworld Ooh. to the point that there was actually found in a Roman priest's um, they called them cells at the time that, the, that they were. There was a trumpet. And they, they, why is it made out of lead? They would actually go and commune with people that wanted to talk to dead family members. They would use the lead trumpet to speak to the underworld. Like a cell phone. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah now you said it. There's an app. There's an app. It's a lead app. And one of, one of the final things that lead was really good for was you can use it in binding spells to stop bad habits and to overcome addictions. So, you know. It's, Useful it's, but deadly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, number seven. How, what, what time is it? Oh, 
Oh, yes, I wanted to show. This is the wondrous thing about the lead pipes and what everybody went crazy. The one, let's see, make sure you're holding it the right way. Okay, that way. Okay, right. The one on the right is a pipe that's, oh, you can pass it around. The one on the I'm right done. is a pipe that's 1,200 years old. The one on the left is a pipe that's 3,800 years old. The one in the center is only 40 years old. So, first Roman era, second Roman era, just after World War II. Which pipe would you want to drink water out of? Uh, <laughs> even though it's lead? <laughs> well, over the centuries, they build up a mineral layer on the inside. It sticks to the lead and actually makes it safe. Oh. That's why they still there's certain parts of Rome that still have the old lead pipes because they've completely covered the interior with a layer of mineralization that does not allow the lead to touch the water. Oh, so Caligula was just 3,000 years early. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was, they, they had just first test subject. Yeah, they were the first, that, that first group of Romans that went absolutely bonkers and had like the blue lines on their gums and everything, that was right after it was all installed. Yeah, because that was all around mm -hmm. one And they, they did it because a lot of Rome okay. at that time was fluctual, the earth moves. So you could bury a lead pipe in the ground and it could move three or four feet and the nature of lead, it would just bend mm -hmm. and warp with the with the movement and rather yeah. than breaking. Very useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ovid mentioned that actually, and the Metamorphosis mentions the lead pipes of Rome. So mm -hmm. they were there at the time he was writing. Oh yeah, it was, it was a great thing. <laughs> but like now, there's a lot of places in Rome and Italy and Europe that will not take out the lead pipes because they've gone in and they've tested that that mineral coat that's built up over the centuries has made the lead pipes safe. Yeah. <laughs> just wait so you just have to wait a couple wait. of thousand <laughs> years. And, well, they, they have a new technique now where they'll actually go through the lead pipes and if any of it's cracked, they send a, a type of plastic balloon through and they heat it up and it bonds to the inside of the pipe and it basically coats it with plastic. It makes it just, you know, totally safe. Yeah. That's modern technology. So we went from metal to plastic. <laughs> Should have stayed with metal. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Number seven. This is the last noble metal. Uh, mercury, also known as quicksilver. It is one of the heaviest metals known to mankind. It's actually two atomic numbers heavier than lead. But because of its liquid nature, um, it's known as a living metal because its natural state is to be in a liquid. Um, the only time it comes as a solid is like this stone here, which is, it's a, I think it's a piece of feldspar or quartz, something in that family. But when it's, when it's in nature, it bonds to stones and it looks like little silver BBs. Um, they're, they're actually hard there. What they have to do is they use a, a, a chemical process where they smash the rock and they use a weak kind of acid to draw the mercury out. And then they, then they, uh, mercury will drop to the bottom of the vessel and they have a filter um, that catches all the big aggregate stones and all the mercury just comes out the bottom. And that's the same, it was a process that was developed 3,800 years ago and they still use the same process today. So sometimes the, the ancients really didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see, it is, um, Mercury has been found in many ancient cultures and tombs. Uh, a lot of uh, modern cultures, Santeri being the most prevalent, use it as a protective warding in their homes. They'll sprinkle it around on the carpets and stuff. I wouldn't recommend that because the vapor from it can be breathed in over time and it can build up in your brain. Uh, if you ever think you're having any kind of mercury toxicity, uh, just do three or four days of really hot sauna treatments and sweat it out. It'll sweat, it'll sweat it right out of your system. Yeah. It'll actually come out, come out. You know the story of the Mad Hatter? Yeah. Yes. That's because back then they used mercury in hats. Yeah. And to form the felt. To oh, form the felt. Mm -hmm. And that's where the term Mad Hatters come from. Because as they would try on their own hats, the mercury would get into their skull. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the bases behind 
one of the best characters that that guy has ever written, <laughs> the Mad Hatter. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, thank so you. So I was Mercury in the hat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Mercury in the hat to Make shape the felt. felt. Yeah, they use it, they oh, use they it to shape, it yeah. It's part of the felting process. Yeah, because it's, yeah. so, it's so heavy and flows like water, you can make a, frank, a mold and put the mercury in it and then push the felt in, and then the mercury will actually force the felt into that shape. But then it, the felt also absorbs micro amounts of the mercury. Put it on your head, touches your skin, right in. And then, you know, those guys are working with it barehanded, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. This yeah. No, okay. no OSHA. <laughs> no. Jinx. Now, the Greeks... Pre-OSHA, yeah. The Greeks used mercury in healing practices, uh, primarily for uh, skin afflictions. That actually works. This this was this is a, a a modern day practice in certain parts of the world too, where they take a mercury based cream, and it works really good on things like psoriasis <laughs> or seborrheic dermatitis. Um, they didn't realize that it would that its secondary side effect was to cause insanity and blindness, <laughs> and multiple personality disorder, and all kinds of other things. Um, in the Middle Ages, it was discovered to be now. Bear with me here. It was discovered to be a um, an effective cure for syphilis. Now, which type of madness do you want? <laughs> yeah, take it. <laughs> well, either uh, either, uh, either uh, let, either let the syphilis make you go crazy, or the mercury stops the syphilis, and then you have to sweat the mercury out. Then you go crazy anyway. Then you go nuts anyhow. <laughs> Super crazy. The side effect was sadly <laughs> insanity. Yeah, like I said, choose your choose your madness. Set a thief um, to take a thief. <laughs> mercury in cosmetics was found to be fatal yeah. to the people that used it. Mm-hmm. Um, oddly, oddly, there were. Um, it goes back to Egyptian times as well. They used it a lot because um, <coughs> it's how they made their faces so shiny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not realizing how dangerous it was. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Fatal to use it. Uh, giving rise to the use as a protective metal for driving away death and decomposition when used in ritual ambulance. Um, there's an old example of one. I, I could not find the picture of it. There was an old example of one in the Vatican in Rome. It's a glass vial from. 2200 BC, it's filled with quicksilver. And it was worn by one of the Caesars to ward off evil spirits. Did it work? Uh, well, he lived to be 98 years old. So back then. <laughs> he became the evil. Don't break the glass. It, it might have actually been, it might have been um, Augustus Titus. That, that may, I think that's that's who they had it with. Cursing great glass. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. In case in case of overthrow, drink. That's why they don't get you. Uh, it's magically used for open communications with the gods and progress. Um, once again, which type of insanity do you want? Now, back then, a lot of the people, a lot of the people that had these afflictions were thought of as touched by the gods. Uh, mercury was not understood, so they didn't understand that it builds up in the brain. Eventually, start having bipolar issues. You can have multiple personality disorders, but um, using it in in a strict ritual sense, um, it's meant for protection and driving away things like death and, and misfortune. Couldn't you have a small level or thermometer on your altar to? Represent the Absolutely, mercury. yeah. If you can, if you can find one that's still made with mercury, because they switched to alcohol a long time ago. Yeah. That raw, be the old one. Raw mercury is kind oh, of we hard. We can't have nice things. All those safety yep. precautions. Well, and it's safety people. Let's see. For everybody. Open communication with the gods. Progress of financial plans. Um, after all, mercury was the messenger of the gods. So he takes, you know, you want something to succeed, mercury. Um, it's also for, oddly enough, mental clarity, higher learning, and education. Hmm. That's that's you? where that's where you keep a little you know you keep a thing mad of it, genius. you know, a little yeah. thing like that, full of mercury. Yeah, mad genius, exactly. That's yeah, another I was say that way to of... yeah. Uh, let's see, the ability to be a persuasive and convincing speaker, due to its liquid and flowing aspects, 
<laughs> now here's a warning. Do not to be touched or breathe the vapors. It's safe in a small glass jar. In modern magics, it can be placed with silver or chrome for safety. Mm. So you don't, yeah, but don't ever leave it somewhere where it's open to the air in your home because those gases will eventually, it, if breathed in, it will re-solidify in your system and eventually build up in your brain. Hi, there is a company that sells it in sealed vials. Yeah, you get little ampules of it. Yep. Yeah, that's what you call it. Yep. Yeah, that's what it's called. Okay. Now, Believe it's sealed. Going, going back to <laughs> lead for a moment, a note about lead, and we, we were joking about this before we got going. Uh, many alchemists tried to convert lead to gold. Uh, this would require nuclear fusion, which is a technology, thankfully, that the ancient people did not have access to. <laughs> because if they were ever able to make lead turn into gold, there would be a little mushroom cloud that would come up from their table. <laughs> which is why they come up with the idea of cursed gold. Yep. And all of these metals, um, they can all be cleaned and cleansed and grounded out using either smoke or sunlight. So that's, you know, that's the easiest way to cleanse it. Because some of them don't play nice with water. <laughs> all right. Um, do we have enough time to... Yes. Okay, we got plenty of time. Yeah, it's 9 o'clock. See, this, hopefully that comes up good. Mm -hmm. That looks like a, a piece of metal with little BBs stuck in it. That's the natural form of mercury. Um, it bonds to the stone that it grows in, which usually they're feldspar or, or a type of jas jasper amalgate. It um, it bonds to it and stays in it, and you actually have to like juice it like an orange to get the mercury to, to come out. And they use a chemical process to do that. And then this picture I really like. Um, starting here on the right, Say or, yeah, where my finger is tapping. That's a lead pipe from about 3,800 years ago in Rome. This one here is about 1,200 years old. And the one in the center, this, this blows my mind. This is an iron pipe that was put in after World War II in about 1948. It corroded like this in just 60 years. Now look at the difference. Lead pipe, no corrosion. Lead pipe, 3,800 years old, no corrosion. What happens in these old lead pipes, the water they were using was so mineralized that over the centuries, it made a mineral coating inside the pipe and actually made them safe. But for that first 1,000 to 1,200 years, you had a lot of crazy Romans. <laughs> it was all wow. lead poisoning that drove, drove a lot of the insanity. Um, a couple other examples of This is, this is modern lead, this is solder. I just wanted people to understand how soft and malleable lead is. I mean, I could squeeze this like a, just mush it down to a ball and then straighten it right back out with no problem. Was that a solder? <laughs> or not. Solder. <laughs> or a knot. <laughs> yep. Believe it and, or not. And another thing is, there, with copper, you used to be able to use lead solder to get them together yeah yeah you'd seal them yeah yeah it would, it would go in and, and yet most solder these the days are actually lead free mm -hmm. or damn near lead free yeah that one that particular solder there has only got about 20 percent lead in it yeah i i work with stuff that has three percent but then I, I also need help with this too yeah mm -hmm. womp, womp. thank you for sharing it you're welcome and i'm i'm is it still recording? Because yeah. I'm going to give you a list of um, like gods that you can use to bless these metals and help you with and what a lot of them are associated with. Um, I know I talked a lot of, uh, talked about the planetary and God aspects of the metals, but um, these are all gods of healing or protection and metal. Uh, you have Asclepius, he's Greek, and that was uh, straight up healing. Iyer, is, is a Valkyrian, that's a protection metal. That's a Norse deity. Um, Ermed is Celtic. She's from the Tuatha de Den, and she also was a protective person who used metals in a lot of her uh, medical protect practices. Um, Aju is Santeria. Vulcan is Roman. Everybody knows that Vulcan was uh, 
weapons builder of the gods and we met him on Saturday. Yeah, we met him on Saturday. <laughs> Strangely enough, Apollo, um, because of the gold aspect, he was Greek. He used the he used the, he was a viewed as a very um, powerful healing god because a lot of the a lot of the maladies in the day could be um, assuaged just by standing out in the sun for a couple hours. <laughs> and Artemis, a daughter of Zeus, uh, Mars, of course. Uh, same thing as Vulcan almost, only warlike instead of a forger. Um, Bondia, that's uh, another Roman Roman god of uh, earth and fertility. Uh, that one's associated with, um, oddly enough, Mercury and tin, much along the same lines as uh, Venus. Um, you got Odin, Norse, um, knowledge and strength. His big things were iron and gold. Uh, Bridget Celtic for healing in home also a gold gold she or silver fire of the fort fire of the fort yep Let's see Thoth or Toth is Egyptian he was uh, known for knowledge and healing not really a, a metal associated with him other than mercury um, for the Greek thinking that it increased the speed of the mind um, Zeus, of course, father of the gods. Once again, the, the representation of Jupiter moved over to Zeus when the Greeks um, took over it was that. The other way around. Or it might have been the other way around. It might it's have gone from around. Greek, from Zeus to Jupiter. But the tin, the tin lightning bolts were on their temples. <laughs> did you mention Hephaestus? I did not. I did not mention Hephaestus. Because he didn't. Did, was there a lot of, I don't know if there was healing. I was trying to stick with uh, ma no. major healing aspects uh, of the metals healing as well. Healing aspects, sorry. Yeah, silver. Yep. Hephaestus is more of the forge aspect of Yep, of working with the metals. Yep. Of working with the metal. Yeah, I think we had... Uh, the smith god. Vulcan was... Okay. Yeah, and yeah and Vulcan and Hephaestus were uh, kind of interchangeable, yep. Yeah. And Anne, what was your question? Is there an example of the amulet that you all are making that we could see? Yes. Let me hold that. Thank you. Right Thank there. You. Here it is. It's just a simple, let me make sure you can, you guys, is that close enough? Yep, there you go. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a piece of... Um, Very pretty. Why is it? Why did Iron, you, pyrite. Iron pyrite with a copper wrap. And uh, when worn over the heart chakra, it... Uh, Increases personal power. Is that what I? Better take right that down. There it is. You got a fancy one there, Trey. You got to show that off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it inspires. <laughs> inspires the universal <laughs> energies, <laughs> nourishes the body, and um, blends the powers of the sun, moon, and earth together. And then the copper just you know adds a good good positive energy influx to that gives you a good place to tie it off around your neck. <laughs> you mentioned adding a nail. Uh, yeah, I have some old, uh, they're from the 1800s iron nails that came out of a house. Um, I don't know why I have them. I guess it's a gift from my grandparents at some point. <laughs> but yeah, you could, you could take one of these and add that for strength and uh, clarity of thought and protection. You could probably slide it in. I mean, this is a very simple way of doing it, but see, and you wouldn't wear it like that, but I'm just showing how you can use the wire to attach it. <laughs> Maybe dangling underneath. Yeah, I'm, I'd be, yeah if, you went, if you went around the head of the nail with a little piece of copper, yeah, you could put it right there as a little movie and part. And also, yeah, you're poking the bad things. Yep. <laughs> you could hang that in the door, Thank you. doorway or whatever, you know? Absolutely. You can actually polish this to a mirror. It's almost a mirror now. You could actually polish the iron pyrite and have that sitting somewhere and do the same thing as keeping, you know, having a silver mirror to reflect negative energies back out of your house. This way, people can't bring their negativity in with them. 
probably why a lot of those houses in the 70s have that like six by eight mirror on a wall <laughs> yeah. facing the front door. Yeah, that's what we got. Yeah. <laughs> got tapestry over it, but it's there. <laughs> okay. Got one of those. All right. Anything else, Carl? Uh, I think we're done. Unless well, anyone has any more questions, I think we're good. Well, yay! yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.